once or twice a decade, the deserts of central Australia burst into life. Flooding rains spill into thirsty channels, creeks and rivers. Wind through thousands of kilometres of waterways, they flow across millions of hectares of floodplains of the Lake Eyre Basin, finally snaking their way to Lake Cutitunda or Lake Eyre. This has always been home. Without water, you, you don't have people. You can't sustain life. Any damage to that water, well, it changes everyone's life forever. It's either boom or bust out here in the Lake Eyre Basin. Right now, after the biggest flood in a decade, it's boom time for everything from insects and pelicans to the local people. In the middle of the droughts and that, a lot of people were down in the dumps, saw a lot of wildlife disappearing and dying off. The life after the floods is, is what, what amazes me the most. You can go from this dry, almost bare dirt to vibrant green grasses all come back and the bird life booms again and even people's spirits lift again. Channel Country's uh, been synonymous with cattle production for many years. A unique, pristine environment and uh, we're proud to be part of it. The grass that's been growing here is the same grass that's been growing for thousands of years. Pretty good season. Rain last night is going to uh, keep things growing. Got a bit of David Brook owns several organic cattle stations around the Lake Eyre Basin. His daughter Delene Ray is the chief executive of OBE Organics, which sells the beef he produces. You can fatten cattle in, in, in eight weeks out here uh, after a rain or a flood, even quicker after a flood. It's magnificent. Magnificent. We're in a desert, are we? Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Just to see water everywhere. As soon as it hits that dirt, those microscopic crustaceans hatch out, and that's food for all of the invertebrates here, but then the fish arrive, and you've got the water birds. Water brings incredible life to this place. But a final push for oil and gas is putting this unique and fragile environment under threat, according to Professor Richard Kingsford, who has studied it for decades. One thing we fought very successfully was to keep large-scale irrigation out of this river system. There's a huge wave coming in terms of the impact of oil and gas on this system. We've seen some little bits of changes in terms of these structures on floodplains, but the amount of development that's foreshadowed now in this catchment, we will no longer be able to say this is the greatest desert river system in the world. Much of the gas in this region is considered unconventional gas. That means it's trapped tightly in impermeable rock. To get it out, the gas companies need to drill much deeper than conventional gas and usually need to drill more gas wells and build more roads. And then use complex extraction techniques like fracking and horizontal drilling to release that gas. Everywhere a big road dissects and moves that water, it moves it into places it shouldn't go and stops it going into other places. There are several gas companies operating out here. The industry is confident it can conduct its work safely. This huge development in and around Kungi Lakes has been owned and operated by Santos since the 1980s. Both Santos and the industry lobby group Apia declined to be interviewed and didn't respond to questions for this story. The thing that really worries me is this is a short interim solution to an international problem, but the legacy is going to go on for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. Until now, the extent of this development on the most fragile parts of the basin, the floodplains, hasn't been known. Professor Kingsford and his team have now mapped the development of gas wells on the rivers and floodplains. They found at least 831 oil and gas wells 
linked by more than a thousand kilometres of service roads cutting across the floodplains. We have these structures. One of the most concentrated areas for the oil and gas industry is inside South Australia's internationally protected desert wetland, the Kungi Lakes. Professor Kingsford says the roads and structures disrupt the flow of water, starving some of the thirsty floodplains. You think about all of those plants and animals that are waiting for that water to arrive, that road stops that water getting there and ships it somewhere else. And so they'll die. It's as simple as that. Does it look like there's a, already that type of impact occurring? Yes, we're already seeing that from the satellite imagery. We're already seeing the way in which a flood comes through and gets shifted into different places and stopped from going into other places. There are pollution worries too. Professor Kingsford says the chemicals used in fracking, when high pressure fluid is pumped into the well to help release the gas, could pollute the region. That's something the industry has denied. Where water is extracted underground, it's going to be polluted. We don't know what the pollutants that come out of this industry in this river system are going to do. This is a very fragile system. This type of unconventional gas drilling in the fragile floodplains could double in the coming decades. And it's upstream from here in Queensland's fragile channel country where much of the industry's ambitions lie. And whatever gets in the water upstream ends up downstream. I'd love to see both state governments in South Australia and Queensland really get serious about preserving this river. And that means keeping these industries out of the floodplain areas. The Queensland government has been through three election cycles where they have committed to um, protecting the free-flowing nature of the Channel Country rivers. They haven't delivered on that election promise. The resources industry in Australia and certainly in Queensland generates a lot of revenue and pays a lot of royalty to the government. With those royalties, I guess, comes influence. The Queensland government is still yet to introduce new laws to protect the Channel Country. In a statement, the Environment Minister Megan Scanlon focused on their commitment to establish a stakeholder advisory group to help develop the laws. She added, this is critical work that needs to be done and will inform options for the long-term sustainable management of the Queensland Lake Air Basin. They can either be the government that totally and utterly destroys this channel country and the Lake Air Basin forever, or they can be the government that stop it from happening and protect it for forever. It's very clear that unconventional gas exploration has no place on the channel country rivers. I'm fourth, fifth generation and I'm fortunate enough to walk this land in the same condition that my forefathers and the traditional owners have. The Lake Air Basin is capable of doing what it's doing for another thousand years, 500 years or longer, but it wouldn't take much. It would take probably 10 years of, of exploitation from gas. It would lose all its value and that would be a tremendous loss to the future of Australia and its reputation. It would be, be criminal.